Hello, my name is Kelly and I'm with the Ellie Trust with Children's Health. I'm the moderator for this um, session today. So today we actually have two presenters um, from uh, the Ellie Trust from Children's Health, Children's Hospital and Sophie. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be uh, taking questions at the end of each presentation and also a video. So we're just gonna get started. Hello and welcome to our presentation on how to assess and plan for a successful ESPER project, the 101s of an environmental scan. My name is Robert Gertheria and I'm the program manager with the Los Angeles Trust for Children's Health. Welcome everyone. My name is Erica Hernandez and I'm a project specialist with the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. In today's presentation, we will give a brief overview on the importance of an environmental scan when introducing a project to a school site. You'll also gain a better understanding of the perspective students and parents hold on substance use issues at schools. And lastly, lessons learned from student and parent representatives on engagement during COVID-19. A little bit about Children's Hospital Los Angeles. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that provides pediatric healthcare and specifically the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine promotes healthy futures by attending to the physical, emotional, and social needs of young people ages 12 to 25. The LA Trust was created as a nonprofit arm of the Los Angeles Unified School District in 1991 and helps to support and develop school health programs. We work with the Wellness Network, which currently consists of 16 wellness centers located on school campuses, which provide medical, mental, and some have oral health services to services to students, their families, and their surrounding communities. A little bit about the Wellness Network. It was created through a strategic plan, which established the school-based health centers in high priority geographic areas using health indicators from the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Each wellness center is run by a community health partner as its own site and functions, functions just like any federally qualified health center would. As far as our project, the Wellness and Adolescent Substance Use Prevention Project, or WSUP for short, is a collaboration between CHLA and the LA Trust and five Los Angeles Unified School District high schools in South Los Angeles and their respective wellness centers. The project, which is funded by California Community Foundation and Conrad and Hilton Foundation, aims to support substance use prevention activities at Jefferson, Manual Arts, Fremont, Crenshaw, and Washington Prep High Schools. And as far as the wellness centers, we are facilitating a handoff by connecting youth with the wellness centers or treatment providers, and also supporting the integration of ESPERT into their medical care services. The environmental scan tool was organized to collect information from key stakeholders to build our program organically and with their voices, with the voices of clinic staff, school administrators, as well as youth and parent voices in mind. We wanted to understand the existing culture, as well as policies, facilitators, and barriers, which could hinder or enhance the project objectives at each of the five school sites. As you can see from this outline of the environmental scan, which you should have a copy of, you can clearly see that there is information on the objectives, best practices, and tools which can be used to conduct or inform your own environmental scan. Since the document presents all insight and tools for you to use, we will not go through this in the presentation, but rather focus more on lessons learned and anecdotal but valuable information from student and parent voices. The best practices collected really focuses on building relationships and collaboration with your school site partners and clinics. You want to make sure everyone is on the same page. There are official documents recording your ability to work with students and check-ins put in place to report your progress in successes and challenges. Lastly, it is important to include professional partners such as your IRB and district staff to make sure your project is complying with policies, laws, and anything else put in place to protect students. 
on this list, you will see the people we consider key stakeholders at each school site. They include organizational facilitators, which are usually part of school district staff, school principals at each site, wellness center clinic staff, including the manager, students and parents that belong to that specific school site. There is also a list below of the different uh, things embedded into the environmental skin, which you will see when you read it yourself. Thanks, Robert, for the overview. Uh, now we wanted to switch gears a little bit and introduce one of our former WESEP health leaders. Melissa Diaz was going to join us live, but she is currently in the middle of her school semester. And so we pre-recorded her video, which we'll share with you now. My name is Melissa Diaz. I am currently a second year at Cal State East Bay and I am majoring in psychology in order to become a school counselor. I am currently back home in South Central LA right now, now that classes have been switched to online. And I graduated from Manual Arts Senior High School and back then I was involved in many clubs and programs inside and out of school. But as someone who was raised in a community that wasn't always the safest and has always been surrounded by drugs and violence and along with substance abuse, I knew that I always wanted to get involved to try to make a difference. I personally have lost some of my closest friends and family, unfortunately, to substance abuse. So when I was introduced my junior year, I remember agreeing to participate with no hesitation because I finally saw it as an opportunity to finally give my classmates and my friends and it, basically everyone around me the proper information about substance abuse and where to find the resources that they never realized that was available for them. A lot of students at my school actually use drugs as a way to deal with their stress and problems. And if they were ever caught drinking or smoking, they would usually just get the campus police involved. And rather than getting the proper guide that they needed, or basically like trying to figure out what the actual problem was, was a main issue that I was very concerned with. And I just knew I wanted to make a difference because these are my classmates, these are my friends, these are my families, these are people that I'm surrounded by and I see like, I see them, I see them slowly slipping into this path that they never wanted to go down to. I honestly just want to share the importance of including student voices and why it's very important because as students, we see what's happening around us. I'm telling you, this are, these are the people that we're surrounded with every day. And it's often we are put into a spot where we feel like we're being ignored by adults. And we want to help, but because we feel like our age limits us, like it limits, restricts us, I guess. And we want to reach out. And sometimes we just don't know how or where to reach out to. And Many of us don't have the proper guidance that we need in our life. So when you include us, not only do we feel heard, we feel motivated, inspired, we get the courage to like challenge and call out the issues we encounter. And I do wanna share real quick a, a story when my senior year of high school, at the time I was ASB president of the school. So I was also graduating and we had to find more students to, I guess, I don't wanna say replace me, but I guess to continue the message. And that day we were talking about um, underage drinking and how to prepare not only ourselves, but those around us if we were ever caught in a situation that we were uncomfortable with or what to expect and what to do if we ever needed help. And we demonstrated by using the junk goggles and my, my classmates loved them so much. They were so amazed by them. And we did get, we did, we did talk a lot. We bonded a lot actually that day. I really loved that day. It was so fun. Um, and we were presenting, but I feel like what really got my classmates' attention was the fact that 
I was presenting along with Erica, and the fact that they saw their classmate, a student, was a bigger picture for them. They realized how much of an impact we have as young voices when we speak up and we share. And like, when it comes from someone your age, it's easier for us to relate. So already my classmates, these are all leadership kids. These are all people who already had a major role and impact in my school and our community already. But, but with the help of the presentation that day, they were more motivated to focus on finding deeper solutions with and like whatever problem we face. They weren't afraid to speak up. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that day. Mm -mm. It changed their lives, I feel like. <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to share this because I feel like it's proof that when you reach out to students, it's not only making a difference in their personal life, but it's making them realize how to fight for change and how to figure out the need for change. I understand that even though because of the, unfortunately because of the COVID um, situation right now, that it's hard for us to reach out to students. And I do want to share with you all real quick that you can always reach out to, I feel like, I feel like this generation, you can always reach out to them thanks to social media because our schools usually always have school accounts, our clubs, programs. If we're fighting for something or if we represent something, we usually make an account for it on any platform so you could yeah you could always catch us there <laughs> um but yeah that's all i have for today um thank you guys all for taking the time to listen and yeah i wish you guys all the best i hope you guys stay safe out there take care of everyone else around you spread love and happiness and yep yeah, that's it bye guys <laughs> We thank Melissa for her participation and support over the last few years. Manual Arts High School has been very important to our project, and we couldn't have done it without the help of the students and their community rep, Ms. Wendy Ayuso. Ms. Ayuso has been with the school for 10 years and has seen parent involvement grow from roughly 10 parent volunteers to anywhere from 30 to 35 parent volunteers. When discussing the importance of parent voice, she felt that since parents have different parenting styles and different perspectives as to the needs of students, it was critical to give them space to share those thoughts, especially because they all have one common goal, which is to set their children up for success. I also asked about how substance use prevention education has impacted parents, and she feels they've become more open and more encouraged to talk up to their kids about these highly stigmatized topics. One key takeaway she felt was important to share with you all was that given everything that's impacting our country, she has heard from parents that some youth were turning to substances to cope, which leads me to the final point in regard to parent engagement during COVID-19. Ms. Ayusa encourages us all to stay motivated and continue to reach out and work with parents. She has seen an increase in the amount of support parents need and knows that outside partners are an important resource as they deal with the current reality. And finally, I think in preparing for this presentation and after talking to both Melissa and Ms. Ayuso, I learned that while we are assessing school culture and how we can support youth in the wellness centers, it is also interesting to see how young people and parents were also assessing and in essence performing their own environmental scans. We started the project with ideas based on the needs assessment and as we started these relationships with youth and parents, we adjusted our approach to the work by listening to their concerns and needs, which helped in earning their trust and we hope to continue those relationships through our work. Engagement during COVID-19 has had to continue but has really only changed in the matter of not being able to meet in person. We've been working to adapt our work to the new normal by switching to engaging on online platforms. We've also engaged with students and administrators, including the ADA allies, to conduct surveys to better understand how to support school staff and clinic staff. We're working with health teachers to better connect information directly to students during health classes. And whenever possible, we're, whenever we're conducting outreach or engaging with students, we understand that this is a space to allow for engagement between peers, to support overall mental health and wellness. And it also allows for the ability to students to check in with, our, with us, an adult, and with each other and provide an outlet for any stresses that they might be experiencing. 
We thank you all for joining us today. We have included our contact information and we'll also be with you live to take any questions, questions you may have. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Kelly, do we have any questions? Hi. Um, hi, everyone. I believe since there's no questions, I'll be starting. My name is Safani McCurria. I'm with Contrast Health Services. Let me just bring my. Oops, sorry. Slides up. Um, and so I'll be talking with you guys today about universal screening for substance use disorder with a focus of opioid use disorder um, using the CRAS screening tool. Um, and I'm a school-based pro provider with our Contra Costa Public Health um, Services. And so in this, I'll talk about screening in adolescents, reviewing the screening tool, the craft, particularly the craft tool that we used, and then a little overview of our school-based clinics along with the workflow we used in screening data, and then um, what to do with the data or the screening uh, in terms of brief intervention and referral to treatment. Um, and so I want to talk about why we screen teens for substance use. Um, and as we heard, it's, it's common and often teens use uh, or adolescents use substances for many reasons, whether it's to for new experiences or experimenting, attempting to deal with problems, desires to perform well in school, um, coping with um, stresses in life, peer pressure, or just um, to feel good. We also know that it's a little riskier in the adolescent population. Um, there's a greater susceptibility to risk and severe consequences that may be related to substances such as riskier behaviors leading to STD or riskier behaviors leading to situations of um, violence, sexual assault, or even suicide and potentially um, links to incarcerations and arrests with substance use as well. Um, we also have seen studies that shown uh, youth or adolescents who uh, start using substances earlier and have a higher likelihood of substance use disorder and addiction later in life. And that um, we're trying to delay onset of use to kind of delay that and also help the developing brain fully develop. We also um, know that it often goes undetected in clinic settings. If you don't screen, you don't ask, you don't know what's going on. And screening is really an opportunity to um, assess if there's any substance use, but also for any positive reinforcement to decrease the chance or delay initiation or discuss risky behaviors and use motivational interviewing to try to um, decrease or change behaviors. Um, so, as I mentioned, there's a greater susceptibility uh, for teenagers, and that's really because they have a neurodevelopmental susceptibility. This is a picture of the brain developing from childhood to um, through the adolescent period, and so up through your mid 20s. And we see the first parts to develop in childhood are really the areas that are important for um, crucial drivers of drug use, which is reward and pain. Um, 
And the last thing to develop in adolescence is your prefrontal cortex, which is the front part of your brain that you can see in these pictures. And that's really important for impulse control, regulating emotions, making sound decisions. So teen brains are really um, sensitive to the rewards of substance use, but might not be uh, or, let, or might be less apt to making, thinking through consequences, thinking through um, controlling impulses, thinking through the choices. Um, when we see studies, and this is a study just using alcohol and marijuana, um, uh, correlating age at substance use onset and later addiction, we see uh, the earlier onset of, so the younger adolescent years of 13, 12 or 13, 4, has a higher percentage of addiction um, or substance use disorder dependence later in life for both alcohol and marijuana and the delay of these, the onset, the less percentage or likelihood of addiction later in life. And, and how common, so that's um, how common is substance use? And so I'm just gonna go through some data to show you uh, in adolescent period, how common it is generally for the population, particularly for adolescents. Um, and this data is from the 2018 National oh, Survey. Sophie, uh -huh. I don't think you're sharing your screen right now. I think it disappeared. Oh, did it? Yeah. Was I sharing it before? Uh, you were very briefly and then it's gone. Uh, let me try again. It says I'm sharing. Let me try. There we go. Where did it stop sharing? I'll show you pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see this uh, one? Uh, I actually can't remember where I last saw it. I think I suddenly saw your face. I thought, you know, yeah. But I think we can start here. I think this is good. Yeah. So I. So as I was mentioning, why we screen substance use is it's common. It's risky, seeing. It goes undetected. Um, and then this is just the images of the brain of the developing brain as we see the, the back of the brain kind of develops more and the prefrontal cortex develops through the mid twenties and that's the front that's highlighted. And that, that's the area responsible for impulse control, um, regulating emotions um, and why uh, sometimes teens may be less apt or thinking about consequences of decisions. This chart was just the one showing the younger ages uh, have a uh, with younger age of substance use onset have a higher percentage of later addiction um, or dependence when you look at the older ages or later in adolescence. Okay, so these figures, as I was mentioning, are from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the 2018. And that, that's a survey that they send to many households throughout the United States asking difference about asking what substance use and also mental health and other questions along those lines to all ages through 12 through um, adulthood. When we look at the question um, past month substance use among individuals age 12 or older, we see about 60% of individuals, uh, they use the data and then they kind of use it as, as estimates to extrapolate to the population, but they see about 60% of individuals said they had past substance use and by far the number one substance used is alcohol, tobacco, then marijuana. And we look a little more at, um, sorry, at binge alcohol use among individuals 12 or older. We see, and we'll see this common theme, the um, transitional age use, so the end adolescents have a higher, um, percent of using in the past month of binge alcohol use. And when we look at the numbers directly, we see that um, about the, so 12 to 17 young adolescents have a lower percentage use, but that number still correlates about to one to, out of 200 adolescents engaged in binge drinking behaviors on five or more days. And for the transitional age use, the older adolescent, 18 to 25, um, these numbers for 2018 correlate to one out of every 11 young adults um, who are currently heavy drinkers. When we look at the past year illicit drug use among people, and this is the past year of 12 or older, we said about 19%, a little over 19% um, used, past, uh, used illicit drug over the past year. So marijuana is by far the most common, then pain relievers, um, prescription pain relievers, and then uh, tranquilizer sedatives and then other illicit drugs. Um, and when we look at the prescription pain reliever, which is the second used drug, and we look a little closely at the adolescent population, 
in 2018, um, a, the young adolescent population 12 to 17, the, the numbers averaged to about 850 adolescents each day who initiated prescription pain, pres, um, pain reliever misuse, and that's just initiation. Um, and then if you looked at the older adolescent population, again, um, higher number of or young adults who use, so 18 to 25, the numbers average about to 1,300 young adults who, who initiated pain reliever misuse each day. And we look just a little closely at this data. Again, the common thing we'll see is the 18 through 25, the transitional age youth, the older adolescents, um, have a higher percentage of using illicit drug in the past year. Um, <clears throat> and we look a little closely at the marijuana. Um, and again, marijuana is used most commonly as we saw um, in terms of illicit drugs. And again, the transitional age youth have the higher percentage use. Uh, I include in inhalants in this because this is slightly different. We see that actually the 12 to 17 year old population has a higher percentage use in the past year compared to the transitional age youth who still have a high percentage of use. Okay, um, when we look close, more specifically at opioid misuse among people aged 12 or older um, from 2015 to 18, we see that again, transitional age youth, the 18 to 25 has the highest youth opioid misuse um, in the past year. Although we did see a decrease according to the survey from 2017 to 2018. And we do see use within the younger adolescents, although less in the 12 to 17. When you look more specifically at opioid misuse, um, we see by far the majority of individuals who are using, misusing opioids are using prescription pain reliever um, or misusing prescription pain reliever. And that's the blue. So this graph on the right kind of shows you the overlap of the different opioids. So prescription pain reliever is the blue and the yellow is heroin. Small percentage of individuals are using heroin. And then within that, there is an overlap with some people using both heroin or prescription or misusing heroin or, or prescription relievers, pain relievers. And remember when we think back to the illicit um, drugs, many young adults and adolescents initiated um, prescription pain misuse within the adolescent years. We look a little more closely at opioid misuse and isn't surprising this graph is very similar to the opioid um, misuse graph given the that's the large percent of what is being used in this population. Heroin is, again, transitionally age use has the highest amount of use, use um, but heroin use was lower as we saw than just prescription pain medications. When we look just a little closely at substance use disorder, and this is individuals who are um, said they were diagnosed with substance use disorder over the past year in 2018, there's about 8% of individuals um, who diag was diagnosed with substance use disorder and mostly alcohol, but then illicit drugs, marijuana, pain prescription misuse. And when we look um, over the years, it's kind of stable for transitional age youth. Again, they have the highest rates of substance use disorder um, compared to so the old, older adolescents compared to the other populations, age groups. And we look specifically at opioid use disorder. Um, we see again, transitional age use has the highest uh, um, diagnosis of opioid use disorder among, in the past year. And I wanted to just highlight, because we know that a lot of substance use, a lot of youth may say they're using to help cope with different emotions or different things. And so mental health has an overlap with substance use disorder or substance use. This graphic is just particularly for major depressive disorder and substance use, and we see there is um, a lot of youth, and this is just 12 to 17, who had a major depressive disorder. And then a small amount of that age group had um, a substance use disorder, but then there's an overlap between the two. So it's important to understand the context and reason for use. Um, and finally, when you look a little more at that data from major depressive episode compared to uh, individuals who use substances aged 12 to 17 over the, the past year, you can see a lot of people who had um, use had major, more percentage had major depressive episodes that year as well. And then, so that's kind of, it's common. And so why else do we use, we say it's riskier. We saw the neurodevelopmental 
um, susceptibility, but we also know that substances are associated, substance use are associated with the leading cause of death. And this is from 2019, about 74% of the leading cause of death in 2019 um, were associated with substance so unintentional injuries, suicide and homicides. Um, and we know that within inintentional, unintentional injuries are overdoses and motor vehicle accidents. And we know that within the young adolescent population, motor vehicle accidents is the leading cause of death. Um, there has been many studies that have shown that. Uh, one study in 2016 showed you know, among male drivers between 15 to 20 who are involved in fatal car crashes, about 21% had been drinking. There was a survey also from 2016 or 2017, the, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that asked um, youth or high school students over the past month who, um, if they had been in a car with someone who had been drinking and 17, about 17% 17 said they had and about 5% said they had been drinking themselves. And so um, we know that uh, drunk driving is also associated with motor vehicle accidents. And so thinking about safety and risks with the population. So now we've talked about why screen adolescents. I just want to talk a little more about the SBRIT. So SBRIT stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. Um, and it's really a, a public health approach to delivery of early intervention. So you're screening um, to kind of capture who may be using and, and offer treatment to services for people with substance use disorder and risk of developing um, substance use disorders. You're trying to also delay onset of initiation of substance use. And so that's why it's, it can be an early intervention and really negotiate change as well. And why implement a universal screening or an SBRIT? Um, the routine and universal screening is helpful uh, regardless of the patient, just if they haven't had it. They found studies where providers may think they know who to screen and they're just not very good at identifying who might need it to be screened or who um, is using substances. Uh, and so you, you also use a validated standardized screening tool for the age. So you know it works in this population, you know it's good for a quick screening and it's evidence-based and patient-centered talk. And so you're really using the patient talk to um, negotiate change and discuss behavior modifications. And it can be a more comprehensive integrated approach and really for the early intervention as well when you're screening just to begin up the discussion and try to reinforce positive behaviors. So um, in terms of the screening, there's many different validated screening tools and we're gonna focus on the craft um, for this age group, the adolescent population, uh, uh, which is the one we use in our school-based clinics. And it's really, again, a quick assessment um, of substance use and severity to help identify the appropriate level of treatment and to be able to do it within a clinic context as well. Um, this is the craft we use the 2.1. There's um, several crafts out there, but this included nicotine and tobacco, which we felt was important to ask as we saw it's a high, um, one of the highest used substances. Uh, and this asks about, the there's two parts to the craft. The first part asks about use in the past 12 months and uh, of any substances really. And so if an individual answers zero to all of these, they should answer the first part of the craft, which I'll show you question number five. Um, if they answer one or used any substance at all during the past year, then they answer the full craft. So this is the craft second part of it. Um, it's a new, the actual craft part. It's a mnemonic and it stands for car, relax, alone, forget, family or friends and trouble. Um, and so if anyone had, if they had a zero to substance use in the past year, they still answer the car because we know safety is a concern in um, trying to, uh, decreased risk in terms of that, even if driving with friends and not using themselves. Um, if they had any substance use, you, they would, should do the full craft. Uh, and a positive craft screen is considered two or more yeses. And that just link associates with a higher risk for substance abuse or substance use disorder. And when you look and there's been several studies about the craft and when you look at the craft, they have correlated the score with how likely the individuals have a substance use disorder. And as they go with a higher score, the more concerned for substance use disorder or DSM diagnosis. 
Um, so they chose two because it's higher than 50%, but you can see there's a small percentage who even score one who may have concern for substance use disorder. So the, the screening tool is really more of a way to start a conversation as well with anyone. So in terms, just a little background for our clinics as we dive into the data a little. We are uh, in Contra Costa County, we're through our public health department and we're our school-based clinics. We, due to the COVID currently, we uh, had to close our clinics because the schools closed in um, March and have been seen. I'll talk a little bit of what we've been doing for this, the work here. Um, but we were seeing patients at the time for at 23 high schools and middle schools. We're a teen clinic um, with confidential services uh, and teen physicals. Uh, and so that we did STD screening, treatment, contraception. We screened briefly for mental health, CSEC, um, uh, intimate partner violence uh, and other services within our clinic. We, our teams were built of a health educator and our and a provider and a clerk or MCO, which is um, essentially uh, the individual who drove many of these were vans or drove our van. From the start of the school year, so August 2018 until March, where we were closing our clinics because of COVID, we saw about 2,744, we saw 2,744 patients with a total visit of 7,185. For this school year, we were a part of the Youth Opioid Response Grant. So we got um, funding to begin adding nearly substance abuse screening at our pilot sites. And so we had four pilot sites in addition to all the other services we were doing already. Um, with the funding, we were also able to train all staff in motivational interviewing um, and brief intervention. We also uh, had all our providers through the clinics get a DEX waiver so they could do Medicaid assisted treatment at the clinics. Um, although we only pilot all sites, we wanted to ensure all providers could do it. We also gathered other resources for youth. We were working on hiring mental health support specifically for substance use for this um, grant. And we added screening into our electronic health record. So it's automatic and we can capture more data. As I mentioned, we pilot at four different high school, high school sites throughout our county. Our county is large, so we kind of made sure there was um, focus using the data to focus at what area in terms of opioid use. Um, our visits were from August 2018 and March in these four sites. We, had, we saw 850 patients um, and we had about 2,000 uh, 319 visits during that time frame. When we, the workflow that we had made for our school-based clinics just for um, the pilot sites was incorporated all of our um, teams. So our health educator would see if the youth had a craft score or craft within the last year. And if no, they didn't, if they did, they didn't need to do anything else. They need to rescreen unless they have a check-in before they see the provider unless there's concerns or they wanted to do the screen. If they hadn't had a screen in the, within the last 12 months, they would mark it in the appointment note. And then when the youth came into the appointment, they would hand them uh, the craft to fill out while they were awaiting their appointment. The um, health educator or, or our RN would uh, review with the student, do a brief intervention as appropriate or discuss it and also import it into the SMART form. So the provider could see it within the computer. The, once the youth was seeing the provider, provider would review it um, and we'll talk kind of more about what this looks like. Uh, and then kind of depending on what they found in the discussion, if it was a positive, they would do a brief intervention um, and it, if needed a referral to treatment. So if it was opioid use disorder, they would offer Medicaid assisted treatment and behavioral health services for a school-based van. They was just opioids without a diagnosis quite yet of opioid use disorder. They would offer mental health um, through our vans and we would give Narcan to both of these. And if it was other drugs or substances, we would offer services that were already established through the school as needed and other services throughout the county. When we looked at the data for our um, the youth we screened, we were only able to screen about 639. And we, as we saw with the national um, survey and health, the most number one substance being used is alcohol and marijuana. Small percentage of individuals um, said that they used other substances and tobacco. Um, and then a handful of people said that they used more than one. 
the more than one category is not full data because we weren't able, we were only able to start pulling that information when we had our electronic health record implemented, which was in November. When we look at the scores, we see a vast majority of individuals had a score of zero. Um, and then about 13% had a score that would consider them a positive, so greater two or more. Um, and then 10% had the one out of the students we screened. So what, when we got, uh, what was the next steps after you screen a youth using a craft? We wanna do the finish the experts with brief intervention, which is really focusing on increasing insight and awareness regarding substance use and motivation towards behavioral change, and then refer to treatment as appropriate. So the brief intervention for substance use really starts with raising the subject. You wanna understand the level of concern for drug or alcohol use, and then if low risk or no use, then positive reinforcement, reinforcement encouragement on maintaining healthy habits. And so those are the craft scores that are really zero to one. And you want it, even if the craft score is zero, we, we had many youth who had a zero craft score, but still had some kind of substance use, you still want to explore it, discuss any problem use um, and re review um, a brief intervention with them as needed and kind of see where they are in terms of their um, stages of substance use. If there was risky or harmful or dependent use, you would want to do a brief intervention um, as we would in our clinic, give them resources and referral as agree, as warranted and agreed to. And again, that was the craft scores more than two. Um, and patient may not have a substance use disorder. This is the DSM criteria for opioid use disorder on the right and each substance, they're similar, but each substance has a use disorder or diagnosis. Um, and an easy way to kind of think about it is the four C's for um, substance use disorders, the loss of control, compulsive use, continue despite harm and cravings. Um, and you wanna explore that with the individual and really explore the underlying reasons of why they're using it and um, other things that might need appropriate treatment or referral to treatment. So the brief intervention just to focus a little more on is a, a short conversation. So it's three to five minutes that uses motivational interviewing. So you wanna gauge where the person is as in terms of their, um, uh, on the spectrum of change, whether pre-contemplation, contemplation, they're ready to go. They're actually trying to make changes. Um, and then you wanna give feedback on the risk and or negative consequence of use. And education that the substance can, substance can lead to consequences should be relevant to the, the youth. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be something far in the future or something that you, you should really have a conversation and try to find out what's important. And a good example is if a, that we often see is you playing a sport, maybe they're smoking marijuana and they're noting they're feeling short of breath and you can ask if, they're, if they think that's linked to their marijuana use and maybe to kind of relate it to something that they're, they find value in. You wanna recommend that they completely stop all use for a specific time and see where they are in terms of that. Many youth aren't ready, um, so you want to enhance motivation and negotiate with them if the recommendation is declined. You want to try to attempt uh, to elicit some commitment to change within the brief intervention, and this may or may not take place depending on when the where the youth is on their motive, on their um, on their path and journey. And then you want to follow up and monitor for success or challenges to, to continue to um, as they continue on their process. And then in terms of referral to treatment, you want to um, deliver as part of brief intervention. For us in our school-based clinics, we had our Medicaid-assisted treatment on the vans or the clinics. We had our mental health support for opioid use and opioid use disorder. We had other AOD services and referrals through the county, and we had other services through the school. For the school-based clinics, we didn't have anyone who were positive for opioid use. Um, we did have several individuals positive for um, substance use disorder or other substances and linked to treatments through the county uh, or their schools as well. We did also do the, the same grant within our transitional age population at the homeless shelter and the home uh, transitional aged um, group, our shelter. And we had one positive opioid use disorder there and we linked them to medicated assistant treatment and other services. Currently with COVID, we're not doing this full services, but we still have our mental health support. They've mostly been supporting and getting referrals for our transitional age youth for general mental health. Um, and that has been ongoing through COVID. Um, 
And, that's, and then that's my contact if you had any um, questions, but I can take questions now. All right, thank you so much. Um, we actually have a few questions and, and this will also include for Erica and Robert as well. So it's currently with the burden of COVID and online school, it's been harder than usual to maintain student involvement in my youth group. I've been balancing between pushing for more engagement and cutting more slack due to stress. How do you combat this? Um, yeah, I can start. Um, thank you for your question. I think for us, I don't have a direct answer, but for us, what we've been doing um, is one, I found that just doing check-ins, one, asking them directly what their capacity is or how, how much time and effort they can put into this, any activities we may have for them. I think that's helped a lot. And also, I think with leadership students, um, for anyone that's worked with them, you know, they're used to having a lot on their plates. So sometimes they don't know how to say no. So it's also reassuring them that it is okay to say no. Um, and that's kind of what we've been doing is I, I found over the summer, um, I found a lot of students were reaching out asking for activities um, or how they can participate. I think they were looking for, um, you know, something to kind of balance their home life, school life with, you know, uh, extracurricular activities. So I think that's how we've kind of talked to them and try to balance that out, um, just making sure to do the check ins and then also asking them what their capacity is and how much involvement they want to um, have uh, during these times. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of um, Erica's um, suggestions, uh, we have a student advisory boards and um, you know, some have been easier to uh, contact because contacting them obviously is the first thing. Uh, uh, having conversations with them, seeing how they are, um, and then figuring out if they feel they have the capacity to um, work on campaigns um, or not. And they might change week by week, month by month. So literally checking in with them, having a conversation with them, and then figuring out um, what um, kind of incentives might work. Uh, sometimes maybe it might work that once a meeting, there's one incentive raffled out. Or once a month, there's an incentive raffled out. Um, and that could be anything from, you know, a gift card to um, Uber Eats or, or something, you know, that, that they really appreciate nowadays. Um, but for the most part, it's just having those conversations and really figuring out if they're dealing with something at home, maybe home life is, is not appropriate for them to engage. Um, or, you know, they, they might be nervous about school and nervous about um, what, what this new uh, way of uh, going to school might mean for them, especially if they're seniors and they're dealing with a number of other projects. So, um, you know, just figuring out one-on-one -on -one, uh, what might be going on. And two is just incentives. Um, and incentives look different for different uh, youth. So also figuring out what those um, incentives might look for, for them. All right, our next question is, I'm interested to know what projects uh, slash support teams found most beneficial. And this is for, for anyone, any one of our speakers. Um, so for our project over the summer, um, we, you know, being that we work at Children's Hospital, we have, um, there's a lot of material that we would, that we need youth input um, for. So I think we were fortunate enough that we could get them involved with um, just kind of how do we revisit, how do we rethink social media posts? How do we um, engage young people with infographics? So having that input from them, they really enjoyed that. I think it's, you know, we don't technically, or we don't generally do that when we're on campus, but being because we're virtual, it gave me an opportunity to just kind of send this material over. Um, and they really enjoyed kind of looking at something that was already there and how could they make it better or how could they make it more youth friendly. So I think that's um, something they really enjoyed. And we had a lot of with Robert's um, Summer Academy, we had a lot of opportunity um, to have them explore uh, those, that material. And as Sophie mentioned, uh, we also were part of the Youth Opioid Response Project. So they were also able to help us kind of develop materials um, uh, for the misuse of opioids. So I think that really engaged them, um, especially because we're doing everything virtually right now. Yeah, I think the key word that Erica used is opportunity. Um, obviously, we, we can all uh, figure out um, reasons uh, that working remotely might be a barrier, uh, specifically because we're not face-to-face -face and we're used to doing work face-to-face, -face, but this is definitely an opportunity for us as well. Um, we've been moving this direction for some of us, not fast enough, 
So now having this opportunity to uh, do this 100% virtually, um, it really uh, allows for us to um, showcase, you know, the, the talents that all these youth already have because they've been living this life for a long time, uh, virtual life. And so it really allows for us to learn from them and, and really allows for them to um, navigate, you know, this, this work that they've been doing with posters and markers uh, now in a virtual world. So um, they really appreciate it. And we really appreciate it as adults, at least I do, learning about, um, you know, Canva, Instagram, Instagram Live, all these new uh, forums that um, we're able to use, hopefully even after COVID, because these are very, very valuable. All right, and our last question is, apart from the opioid grant, how are these programs funded? Um, that might be directed. So we're a clinic, and so we um, build minor consent medical, and so we enroll students into minor consent medical as they come through, no matter if they have insurance. Although it would still be covered under their insurance, we want to ensure that it's still confidential as they come through, because they insurance sometimes accidentally bill even if it's a confidential services, and so we do enroll and bill for services through medical. Yeah, and our project is, um, it's been going on for a few years. Um, it was originally funded by the Hilton Foundation and the uh, California Community Foundation. So um, a lot of the work that we've done is based on that. Um, and obviously just like anything else, we're, we're working on making it sustainable uh, by either looking for other grants or by embedding it into the work that the clinic is already doing because people are interested in wanting to get better at doing SBIRT. Um, and obviously with students and school staff, this is something that's very organic for them and something that um, they hope to continue year after year. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? We still have a couple minutes. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, hopefully um, everybody got the link to the PDF for the uh, how to conduct an environmental scan, um, which was the first half of our presentation. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Eric or myself. Uh, we've been working on this for a very long time um, and we've uh, come across a lot of things that might not be mentioned in the scan, but um, you know, might help you implement or adapt it to your particular situation. Um, I guess there's no, there's no other questions. Thank you so much, Sophie, Erica, and Robert for your presentation today. I know um, everyone's learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, have a great one.